Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Commander Clash podcast, episode three on YouTube and also on Spotify. So you can enjoy it either way with our mugs on the face on the video, or you can just listen to our silky smooth voices on Spotify. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And this week, we have something also a little bit controversial, hopefully not as controversial as uh, the mono white discussion we had last last time on episode two. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about power levels in Commander. Uh, so for people who don't know, uh, people like to assign power levels or power ranking system to their Commander deck list. And the purpose of this, uh, the idea behind this, is to make it a little bit easier for people to balance out their own tables, their own playgroups when they're sitting down to play. So it's kind of like a shorthand for saying like, oh, we want to have like a mid-tier power level so everybody bring like fives to sixes uh, on the power ranking scale. And obviously there are some pros and there are some cons to this style of system. Um, and first of all, well, let's let's hear from the rest of the crew. Uh, joining with me is, as always, Richard, the site owner. Hello, welcome, Richard. Well, hello, Tomer. And Marvel in my background. It's so if, gorgeous. If you're listening on Spotify, check the YouTube video because Richard's garage has been <laughs> emptied by like point zero one percent as I took some play mats and plastered them onto my wall. So, so yeah. Are you saying stocks it even? are low and you have to buy now? <laughs> yes, yes. We, I, I heard that Richard's garage contains the next GME. Yeah. <laughs> Limited supplies, the folks. You heard it here. The garage is empty. You have to get your play mats while you still have a chance. <laughs> it, it, is it just me? But like, <laughs> is the wall slightly? <laughs> oh, Richard, hold on. Oh, don't do that wait, to Richard. Wait, wait, wait. Don't no, no, thing. it's it's straight. It's measured. The webcam is not straight. Okay, okay. The webcam yeah. is not all right. straight. All right, because I'm like, Ugh. all right, sure. <laughs> oh, Krim, now, now I got to adjust this. How do I fix this? <laughs> So, so the voice you just heard is none other than Krim, the Asian Avenger. Uh, welcome, Yo. Krim. Hey, Telmer, how you doing? Uh, how's that computer going? I heard last time I checked it exploded. Uh, yeah, no, it works again. You know, my C drive is back, so I actually get to do things, which is ideal. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Fantastic. And rounding out the crew, we got Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive. How you doing, Seth? I'm I'm doing wonderful. I'm excited for this topic. Actually, I, I've been wait. I've been counting down. I, I heard we were going to do this a couple days ago, and I've been <laughs> counting down the days for this podcast because I have some thoughts on you have ranking fun. your deck this way. Yeah. So so for people who have never used a power level guide, uh, it's basically a ranking system from one to ten, generally speaking. One being like the lowest power uh, ranking. Uh, one being basically like a random pile of cards that you've assembled into a legal commander deck. Uh, no cohesion, no nothing, probably no win conditions or anything like that. And as you go up the power ranking scale, as you go up in numbers, um, around three or four would be, you know, some of the sta sample precons that you can buy from Wizards of the Coast, uh, like Commander 2011 all the way to Commander 2020 or 2021. Um, those precons... Generally speaking, you're going to be somewhere ranked between three on the low end, like, you know, the original precons, or maybe five from the latest precons. And then as you go at higher than that, there's uh, more uh, tuned lists, like a six or a seven would be basically like taking a... Uh, a normal a normal concept deck and just optimizing it as well as possible with like the most efficient ramp, the most efficient win cons, but you know, sticking to the flavor. And that can be done with basically any sort of deck. And then once you move to like the seven and the eight, you're playing not only with just like optimized deck lists, but you're also playing with like the most powerful cards in the format, including let's say commander. So not only are you just choosing any commander at random, you're choosing the most powerful ones. You're choosing like the Golises, the Edgar Markovs, the Urzas, that sort of stuff. And you're trying to optimize them pretty well. Uh, and that's like the seven and eight range. And then finally, at the highest point, nine and 10 range, 
This is what we call usually uh, CEDH, competitive EDH, where it's like the most powerful, most competitive decks in the entire format. Nines being like the most CD, like the most competitive version of like you know s powerful tier two deck lists. And then at, reserved at the ten is like the tier one CEDH deck list, the best of the best of the CEDH deck lists. Uh, those residing there. So there's a spectrum. One. Absolute jank, a pile of cards that you just should probably doesn't win very often, if if a ever. One. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we, we, we didn't talk about Grixis politics is a zero. <laughs> <laughs> the pile of Grixis cards is zero. I have a pile of cards. I don't have win conditions. Uh, <laughs> I think I think two because you always go for second place, right? So. Yeah. So I'm never actively trying to win a game. Yeah. What? One is actively avoided, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, so that's a spectrum. That's something that I think a lot of people have been exposed to, especially if you're trying to get like webcam EDH games uh, these days. If you've joined any of like the Grand Prix that, you know, Channel Fireball has been hosting these online events. Uh, Channel Fireball has their own ranking version. Uh, Richard found this um, on Reddit, the, the EDH official or the EDH Reddit subreddit. Um, easily accessible, and they all seem to have kind of like a uniform uh, understanding of of at least the ranking system itself. There's always going to be tweaks. You know, every single ranking system is going to have their own little definitions of what a 7 is or an 8 is, but generally speaking, you know, they put CDH at 9 and 10, they put pre-cons between like 3 and 5, and they put like the optimized stuff between like 6 and 8, but not necessarily CDH and the jank at the very bottom. So now that we under now that we have like a baseline of what this power ranking system is, where you find it, and what its purpose is, what does everybody here at the table think about this, these power level systems? And we're gonna start off with Seth because I know you have thoughts. <laughs> ah, okay, so. I think the intention of these power level scales are good. The goal is to get people to be roughly matched in their commander games, make the games more fun, more balanced for everyone. So I think that's good. At the same time, I think they're absolutely pointless. I think the problem is no one agrees on the scales. We were just talking about this. There's one at Channel Fireball. There's this one we found on Reddit. There's another one here. No one really knows what most of these numbers mean. If someone tells me their deck is a 10, I know what that means. Their deck is busted. If someone tells me their deck is a one, I know that their deck's busted. If someone tells me their deck <laughs> is a seven, I have literally no idea what separates a seven from a five or a six from an eight. There's so much subjectivity there. Like for a metric like this to have any meaning, everyone has to agree on what the individual numbers are actually standing for. And that just doesn't happen. Like, if you're going to do this for pizza toppings, if you told me anchovies were a 1 and pepperoni was a 10, I would get that. But if you tell me that pineapple's a 5, what does that mean? Is that good? Is that bad? I have literally no idea, like, what that actually means. So I like the intention of these scales, but I view them as, like, pretty meaningless for the most part. I think I'm a little bit offended, Seth. Anchovies <laughs> are a 1. How dare Wait, you? If, if negative, is if the negative first numbers, anchovies is weird. I don't know. If, if negative numbers were allowed, anchovies <laughs> would be a negative number. <laughs> I, I I'm with Seth on that one. <laughs> that sounds like there, anchovies there, are kind there, of super disgusting. There there's something that I enjoy maybe once a year. It's like a celebration, you know. You know, you have to just be reminded of the taste of anchovies. I think everybody needs to experience it just once. But do you have to though? Like. <laughs> <laughs> they have a pungent aroma that is very unique, and they have that sweet, salty taste that just cannot be beat. Uh, that you can you can take that quote. Uh, anyway, um, one, okay. What, so one more Seth, real quick you're not thing. you're not a big fan. Arbitrary. One, one more real quick thing to just drive this home, and then I'll let other people talk. If you look at the scale that we're looking at, look at like an eight. A deck has a specific consistent game plan, often following defined lines of play. Every card supports the plan, like. Couldn't Richard's Birds deck or Skeleton Tribal actually fit that definition when I would consider Skeleton Tribal to be like a two, like all the cards support the plan, they're all on the same theme, like they're playing ramp, they're playing cheap card draw, like is Skeletons an eight because it because it meets that <laughs> definition? Ah, or is Skeletons well, a two because side. it's Skeletons? When Richard plays it, I definitely consider it an <laughs> well, eight, so... <laughs> 
there's more sentences in even that definition. You stopped I mean, there. It was like lots okay, of okay. low cost ramp. Many decks, or sorry, uh, uh, means casting multiple spells a turn can be expected as early as turn one. I, can I swear, I bird deck cast oh. multiple spells per turn one. Yes, yes. Mox Ma Ogle oh, fledgling actually, Opry. Actually, we could make a deck, right? <laughs> Ma Mox Diamond fledgling. No, you, you, you like Mox. You play <laughs> Mox. You play Rampant Gross, and then you play your Jank, right? But yeah, th there's some clause in here, isn't there? That every card is like the best in class for that strategy. I mean, fledgling Osprey might well, actually like, be one of the is, best is that 50 just like birds in Magic. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what it actually means is like you're playing an aggro deck. So what is the best aggro creature? Not like I'm playing bad birds. So what is the best bad bird? Right? Like, but and also like high budget to budget list. Like, I guess in theory, if you're running the bird deck, it, you don't really have a budget in mind. But like, I would, I would definitely, I don't know if your deck consistently was like turn one mana crypt. Mox, whatever one of the moxes, Chrome Mox or whatever, uh, Soul Ring, Time Twister, bunch of birds or something like that. Like, that I would say it's it's higher power. It's, it's not an eight. Jank like if deck. you if you line up with the real eight deck, right? Like, yeah. it's not. Correct. It's not the same as like Edgar Markov doing something similar. Like, there's yeah. there's different levels of like bird jink tribal but like you're still running high power cards so it's still higher than maybe even a, like a pre-con for sure like i don't know like running really powerful cards and being able to cast a lot of spells on turn one um it, oh. it, it increases the power level of your deck i think regardless we're gonna, of what we're your gonna deck rate our decks is. shortly so we can f yeah. figure out what the yeah. real power level of birds is because that is a deck yeah. i actually brought to be rated <laughs> That's true. But to piggy, true. piggyback off what Seth said, I think I largely agree with him. Like 10 levels of power is too many. And most people cannot differentiate like a 7 and a 5 or a 3 and a 6 or whatever. Like, yeah, 1 and 10 are easy. So I think the answer is actually just like 4 power levels. Uh, and I don't think you should include like random pile terrible. of cards should not be a category. Right? Like, if you just have, like, random garbage, like, why are you trying to rate your, your deck, right? Like, they're a new player or they're, you know, they haven't put any effort in their deck. Like, there's no point. Same with CEDH. It's a different category altogether. So, like, Tier 1, Tier 2 CEDH decks should not be included because if you're sitting at a CEDH table, like, who cares if you're a 9, right? That's your problem. You didn't bring a 10, right? We're playing CEDH, <laughs> right? So, like, it doesn't matter, right? So, it's really just, like, are you playing jank? Are you playing a really good deck, like a tier one commander, like Edgar Markov, Golo, something like that, or like just everyone else? And I think those are the ones. And if you only have three power levels, I think people can decide more easily, as opposed to at 10, everyone's a seven, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is an above average driver. Uh, you, know, you know, the average size of a shirt in the United States is a large, hence that would be a medium. Right. But it's a large because everyone wants to be a large, right? For for men. Everyone wants to be a large, right? They're for everyone is above average. No one will admit their deck is a three. Everyone has to be a seven to begin with. And then maybe you go to eight if your deck is slightly good, or you go to six if your deck is slightly bad. But you know, we were at Magic Fest and everyone's like, Yeah, my deck's a seven. And then you get steamrolled by like, <laughs> like uh, maybe Crim's uh, turn three Dracoseth or something, right? And then the other person is just casting Kithkin at seven, right? Like, so mm. everyone's a seven. This, the scale's just too much. And there's a little ego in that, right? No one wants to be a two, right? No one wants to be like, my deck is worse than a pre-con. Of course, yes, <laughs> right? So everyone's just a seven. And then you just get this like giant swath of everyone right so this is an interesting thing um basically what you're saying is like remove remove the like the the random pile that's the super low decks you know usually like they could be a random pile of cards but they could also just be like i'm building a story deck we've done we've done story decks before yeah. we've done like tv shows and we're, we're just like throwing random cards not necessarily because they're good together but because we're like I need, I have like all these cast members in the TV show that I want to represent. This one looks like it embodies that character on the show that I like the most. And I'm running it sp strictly for that. I'm not running it because it's a good card. It could be like some Homelands card, you know, that's absolute garbage. And you can't even cast half the game, but it's there because it's a 
cast member. <laughs> so your 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 suggestion would be like don't even have those decks on the power level scale and remove CDH decks uh, from the power level scale too. So this is literally just like casual power level scale, right? Not yeah. not an all inclusive power level scale, a more refined one specifically towards you know those casual to semi competitive decks. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I'm definitely, like, I, I agree with that. I mean, just getting rid of the CDH part of it. I, I've never understood that part. Why why is there a 9 and a 10? So, <laughs> I, I don't mind everything before it, but, like, yeah, the lines between a 7 and an 8 are extremely, like, like I can't differentiate from that. Like, <laughs> I, I legitimately cannot tell you what a 7 and an 8 really is, like, like example-wise. So, I just assume that, okay, the, like, this is an 8 because I, I guess I can make the table extra miserable. That, <laughs> but, and another, another... Krim works on his own scale yeah, of annoying yeah. his opponents. <laughs> this is the scale of misery, right? Like, but, but like, that's the, I, the thing I've noticed also a lot about what, it, what Commander is, too. Like, when, when you remove CDH entirely, right, uh, from the scale, you then have... Uh, like, like, sure, this is a seven deck, but the issue is there's also like this, the social aspect, right? And 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 I think the big part about the biggest thing about commander is, people there are archetypes people just don't like. So, example, if I told you I brought a seven stacks deck, <laughs> you're you're gonna be upset no matter what I do, right? Like yeah. like this could be the highest power stacks deck, the lowest power stacks. Deck. I don't know what a one stacks deck looks like, but just like, random random stacks cards. <laughs> Okay, so so then, yeah, like, his winter orb, you know, but also like a three fairy, right? Like okay, probably like a chaos deck with no win conditions. I think sure. that that's what I assume a chaos deck is. Like you just throw in a bunch of chaos cards, and you have no ways, no ways of breaking the symmetry, no ways of winning the game. You, you just actually have, are just rolling dice and yeah, you just have scramble versus. You have a very specific game plan though, and you're following it, yeah, that's, and that's, all your so cards match eight. it. Right? It's an eight. <laughs> That's an eight. That no, but like, see the thing. But it doesn't is, win the game. Like, it just it just prolongs the game until you lose because you have no way of winning. <laughs> That's like. how I built like ninety five percent of my deck. So yes, prolong the game until I lose. That's actually like the logic behind my deck building. But uh, so the the thing about these scales is they don't actually mention archetypes, right? And and like an archetype is just innately powerful. Like this is technically. Let's just say on the scale of stacks decks, this is a seven or a six compared to other stacks decks. I and I think that just as long as you're playing like a stacks deck, no matter what, it will be considered bad form. So so I which well I, I don't necessarily know like I wouldn't say I agree with that, but that is a thing that most people will just look at. So these scales don't take into account archetypes. So I I don't know how I'm supposed to look at most of these scales. I get the general idea that like I I know that I want the table to kind of like <laughs> play the game. But like, also, you know, like, wh where where can I start playing my archetypes? So like, what what do I put the archetypes? I just don't know how to grade those. Okay, all right. So I'm I'm definitely opposed to the rest of this the table here because I think that uh, power ranking skills are actually good. And something like this, when I'm reading it, I I I I've, I've been f mostly familiar with like the command uh, channel fireball. Um, scaling system just because like when i'm invited to events or whatever uh for webcam edh that's the one that i've been looking at but i'm looking at this one and i really like it and i feel like it explains a lot but it's just it's just kind of it's kind of long you have to read all of it so like if you're talking about a, a deck that has a specific archetype um i think I think it covers that in like the five to seven range where it says it's like has a broad strategy in mind. All right, uh, that's a five. So you just have like, I'm a spell slinger deck. Um, a deck with a plan is is six where I think plan is, is what they mean by like an archetype where it's like, I'm a plus one plus one counter deck. I'm a spell slinger deck. I'm a stacks deck or whatever that. And you're focusing, it, it says uh, multiple uh, cards that synergize well and enable a solid uh, game plan. Spell choices are more focused, mixed levels efficiency. Um, and it, it talks about like different different aspects that you would find in that deck. And then if you want a more powerful version of that synergy archetype deck, you move over to a seven and it says like decks are largely refined down to just the bed, best cards of their strategy. So now if you're a plus one plus one counter deck, you're not just running like all your pet cards, you're running like the best plus one plus one counter 
uh, payoff cards, uh, near perfect land bases, multiple cheap tutors, highly efficient ramp draw, blah, 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 blah. Like, I feel like, I feel like this scale is actually really good. If you sat down and actually like read every single descriptor of it, you should be able to find a pretty fairly accurate, uh, self-assessment. How well people actually use that is a different thing, but I think the scale is actually really good. Like, but I then, think the scale was made by spikes. Okay. Right? And I think that's the biggest problem, right? Like if you know everything about magic, you can sit down and sort every EDH deck into these 10 buckets, right? Because you know what a good mana base looks like. You know what the best cards are for a certain strategy, right? But if you're a casual player and you built a deck, how do you know that you have the best mana base possible, right? You, you don't really, right? Unless you do the research, right? You built the best deck that you could, Right, so in your mind, you're like somewhere at a six or a seven, right? You 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 thought of a strategy, you put all the best cards for that strategy together, and you think you know what you're doing, but in reality, you may not know what you're doing, and you built a three, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the problem comes in, right? Because most people, when they build a deck, they will build the best version of that deck to the best of their knowledge, to whatever constraints they have, right? And like so, like the rating will just naturally be higher. But in reality is, you know, there there happens to be better cards for your strategy, right? Hey, Richard, birds are not the best aggro creature. Have you tried vampires, right? If yeah. you did that, like your deck would jump like four power levels, you, you know, trying to play the exact same aggro tribal strategy, right? Or, you know, did you know there are these reserve list cards that will increase your mana base power, right? Like, so that's why I think a casual player will have a really hard time doing this. And like, if we basically live and breathe magic every day for like literally the past decade or something can't determine this power level scale. Like how is someone who plays like their commander deck like once a month or once a week going to figure this out, right? And the answer is they don't. And everyone is a seven, right? That's my <laughs> conclusion, right? It's like, a, it's very difficult to actually bucket this without like extensive EDH knowledge. Yeah, I mean, oh, I've, seen, of... I've seen tons of people rate their deck like a six or a five because they're like, ah, it's just cards I own, dot deck. But cards I own from which era, right? Like, if I show up with my <laughs> Ixalan made, like, commander deck versus, like, you know, <laughs> like, the, an older block or uh, any other block, like or an Eldraine deck, right? <laughs> yeah, like, I'm going to get bodied, right? And then, like, so, well, oh, that's a six compared, like, I mean, I this is just what I have, so, it, but it's a six. And to, like, piggyback on what both Richard and Homer said, like... Everyone has to be working on that scale for it to make sense. So, like, if our Commander Clash playgroup wanted to rank our decks based on the scale, we could probably do a pretty good job of that. But if you show up at a random command fest and you're playing with three random people, like, unless they have also read the same scale and thought about it in the same way you are, you knowing the scale or ranking your deck based on that scale doesn't really have that much value because they aren't working with the same, like, you know, framework as you are, essentially. I think I think you bringing up like going to an event like a Channel Fireball event or something like that is a good point because I think that's like it's gr the greatest strength of this power ranking scale is like let's say you want to go to an event and you want to play Commander with strangers like a Channel Fireball like a GP what what are the options how do you quickly find people who are roughly in the same power level as you or like roughly the same balance as you um, if it's like there's like hundreds of people looking to play games. There's so many tables. You don't know where to go. You just find like three other people uh, sitting next to you or something like that. I was like, hey, let's play a game. Um, everybody brings out their deck. Uh, what, are, what are the options? I feel like the power ranking system is at least like, at the very least, like if you people put like a number on the tables and be like, this is for like the one to three range. This is from like the five to seven range. This is from like the eight to ten range, something like that. And they have a loose they have a loose definition of the power ranking somewhere there. Now at least you can go there and then you can fine tune, right? But what if they really love That's anchovies three buckets, like you? Like I suggested. <laughs> And I really yeah. hate anchovies like me. Like, aren't you going to be off balance anyway? Like, going back to, to anchovies there? Like, what about narrowing it down like Richard said? Like, when I look at this list, yeah. having three I different like numbers for pre-cons seems excessive to me. Do you really need, like, 
pre normal precon, strong precon, slightly upgraded precon, and then decks with a plan. Like, couldn't you put all those into one precon bucket maybe and get this down to like they, they all play together, right? Like if you're a three, yeah, and someone is a four, you're not like I can't play with you. You're a four. Like get out of here, <laughs> right? Like you're gonna play together anyway, right? So you might as well just put them in the same bucket, right? I don't. Yeah, I don't think that's an intent either. It's not like your fives can't play with fours or sixes. I think like the entire idea of it is you want to play within a, a general range. Like, what you want to do is you don't want a, a 5 to be matched up with a 1 or an 8. or a, Like, you want you want the 5 to be matched up with a 4 or a 6 or a 5. I think, I, I think like, trying to get, like, a perfect synergy... First of all, you would need a lot of people with a lot of different decks to hope to get, like, you know, the perfect number balance or whatever that is but also it's just not it's not viable and even if even if everybody has a five at the table for example the magic has so much variance that some people just might run hot right like my deck might pop off while yours might just get mana flooded it doesn't mean that our decks are not like similarly balanced to each other it just means we played one game of magic the gathering there was a lot of variance in it and it so happened that mine showcased a lot better we see that all the time in commander clash Right, like we've had we've had decks where we think you know one deck is way stronger than another, but just based on how things drew, maybe somebody drew nut and like took somebody out really really fast. Uh, maybe you know somebody wheeled at an inopportune time. You know, just like stuff like that happens, and like the sample size of like one or two games is not going to be a good uh, determining factor. But I think like yeah, just brackets I think are a good idea. If, if we narrow down like the number of categories, maybe it'll be a little bit easier to grok, but like I'm looking at, at this list and like, even if I'm a newbie, I feel like this is basically the best way I can find uh, a, a good way of, of figuring out what my deck's power level is because like, it's literally like a checklist. Like, oh, uh, I don't know if my lands are really good. Well, it says like decks of a plan. Most uh, lands entering untapped are prioritized. Well, all my all my mana fixing lands enter tapped, so that doesn't really match it. And then like I basically like go through like a checklist. Like are my lands entering mostly untapped? Uh, yes or no. All right, so that's going to be a determining factor. Uh, am I running the best cards for my archetype? Yes or no? Uh, well, I'm running a lot of pet cards, so probably no. And like stuff like that. Yeah, how many tutors am I running? I'm running no tutors. You know, like I'm just hoping that I find the the removal when I need it. Like that sort of stuff. <laughs> I feel like those are some of the more objective ones, but then you have like, how do you know if you're playing a spell slinger deck? To go back to that example, how do you know if yeah. your deck has a broad strategy in mind or a definite strategy in mind? Like, where does your broad strategy? You add one more ponder, and then all of a sudden, now you have a definite strategy, <laughs> and you're a six instead of a five. Like, untapped lands or like how many tutors is pretty objective, but some of that stuff seems pretty subjective to me. Okay, well, we have clearly some disagreements on the power ranking scale, but now we're going to uh, see how well we can use this particular power ranking scale um, to determine our own decks. So all four of us brought uh, decks that we've played in the past, and we're going to use this power ranking guide. Uh, if you're listening to us on Spotify, uh, Check out the video because it's on the screen. <laughs> we, or we'll we have like, like a link to oh. it yeah, on the well. article section too. Uh, but we're using this power level guide in EDH that so Richard found. Uh, again, it was from like the Reddit subreddit. And it's one of the first uh, things you'll find if you like type in power level uh, guide commander in Google. You'll find it in the top searches. We're going to see how well we can use this because like some of us are saying that it's not really good. Um, and some of us are saying that, you know, uh, it is really good. So let's let's start <laughs> off with uh, "Welcome to the Salt Mines" by Krim. What is so so? So, uh, so briefly describe your deck, Krim, for yeah, people on the podcast. Okay. Your deck oh as yeah, look it over. Assume, assume you're at a pod of new players, and you have to describe your deck so that and, people understand. Yeah. So this is for everyone listening at home. This is my super friends deck that I have in paper. Uh, it's Esper. It's got Navinriel as the commander. It was Amanatu, but since you know, uh, you know, spell table times and you know, webcam times, I had to change that up. 
And, uh, like, yeah, so it's just about playing Planeswalkers, because I've always loved Planeswalkers in Magic, right? Man, uh, I've, uh, like, I, what if my pet cards, example, like, a lot of my pet cards are really good cards, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, example, like, Jace the Mind Sculptor, I just have memories tied to it, so I play that, right? And the card's actually not great in Commander, but, um, and then, like, cards like Three Fairy. So there, there are tons of Planeswalkers, but the issue is... Uh, I would say that because of the Planeswalker rep and whatnot and how those decks usually go, immediately this, like, catapults my, like, power level up, right? Uh, but, yeah, so that is actually my game plan. Just play Planeswalkers, sweep the board, have counter spells. That's it. I noticed that there's no uh, wheels with the Hall Breacher, which, <laughs> I mean, you are benevolent. I, I don't... Sir. I don't need to have wheels anymore, you know? <laughs> like, just the idea that I could swat some draws is good enough, right? <laughs> like, I don't, I like, the wheel part is, like, you know, like, sure, why not? Let's let's let people have a good time here. They can wheel. <laughs> <laughs> let's let people have a good time here, Counterbalance. Yeah, I, yeah, like, sure. Maybe Not too happens. much of a good time. But yeah, some... just enough of a time. So This is, like, the perfect right, What's your power level? On. Yeah. Uh, I say this is a – well, okay. I feel like this is an 8. An 8. An 8. I would say this is as powerful I could, I could like – actually, it could be, a, I guess, like an extremely high 7. Uh, mm. but, <laughs> <laughs> like just on the brim of it because there are things in here that, are, that just aren't great. I think like Ashiok's not great, but I just play it because I have a cool art version of it, right? So like I, I, I think this is an 8 though. Okay. Hmm. I think this is actually. I think it's actually really tough. I I was leaning more towards like high six, low seven, based on the definitions that are that are given there. Like, mm -hmm. uh, right. it definitely has a plan. It doesn't really have cheap tutors for the most part. It's kind of just like I, I got a bunch it. of planeswalkers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it doesn't have a bunch of like cheap cantrips to find pieces either. So you don't really have that. As far as like a bunch of staples. You don't. I mean, you have cards that are good for the deck, but it's not like overly staply. I don't think outside of like the soul rings. So I would say like somewhere between six and seven, based on the scale that we're looking at, is where I'd put yes. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I would say it's a six because yep. you have like some dirty pet planeswalkers in there. Yep. I I think if we go by the scale and you want to play planeswalkers, you'd have to play doubling season, and then that would put you into a seven or eight. Or like a uh, deep glow skate, right? But like, here's the problem with it, right? The deck is a really good Esper Planeswalker deck. Maybe the best mm -hmm. you can build, possibly, right? But it's Esper Planeswalkers, right? And the strategy itself is a bit awkward. And then there are some Planeswalkers that are not strong, right? But does but, it not get boosted by the fact that it has a combo? Maybe. The combo, the combo being the Oath with the Fairy? Uh, like, yeah, so like Chain Veil... Right and oh one, yeah, chainville yeah. combos. Like, yeah, yeah. Very. But yeah, you don't yeah. have but, any way to find it. You're yeah. just kind of like, right. I got a hundred cards. Maybe I'll draw them. So if you had like a bunch of demonic tutors and vampiric tutors, and your goal was like to find that every game, mm -hmm. yeah, then I'd be, then I would probably be more willing to put it a little higher. But I also so, think like, can you like put this at the same level as like a Golos deck? No, or, I, or, I, I would. Would those be like? Eight? Sevens or eights? Yeah. I think those, just by... Those are by, CDH decks, though, right? Those are just decks. I, I would say Golos is, like, more pushing, like, closer to CDH than this deck, right? I mean, I would say this is, like, about... It could it could play against a Golos deck. It can play against those decks. But the thing here is I'm not... I don't know. Like, I, I, I think this deck itself can play against them. That's, that's what that so, would mean for me. Okay. So I think, like, this is literally the definition... Of six, as 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 said by this guide, decks have a d definite strategy in mind. This definite strategy is, you know, super friends, and you're built around your planeswalkers, supporting your planeswalkers, making sure they don't die. Like that's where the commander comes from. Um, that's where. <laughs> That's uh, like everything's built around that. Like there's a lot of board wipes, you know, settle the wreckage, stuff like that is is to protect the, the, the planeswalkers from removal. There's a ton of board wipes in this deck specifically for protecting the, the planeswalkers. And there's ways to get more value out of these planeswalkers of like Oath of the Fair and stuff. So the deck has a definite plan, right? So that's that's the first sentence of six. Spell choices are more focused, but mixed levels of efficiency, arguable, 
like are all all the planeswalkers as efficient as as possible are all the the board wipes as efficient as possible maybe not like i don't think i don't think like every single card is as efficient as it could possibly be and there's definitely like some notable uh cards that are missing like you don't have like a mana crypt or anything in there you don't have like the most efficient ramp for example um and so, that's intentional that's like by design yeah. right like yeah so. yeah but 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 i think that's that's just following what what the definition of six is lanes entering untapped are prioritized i think that is definitely the case i see like maybe one or two uh lands an interval tap like <laughs> celestial, celestial colonnade. Colonnade, which yeah. is not good in commander but i love <laughs> there's it. an arcane sync tim but for the most part almost everything enters the battlefield untapped and then uh most decks contain at least one hard win con usually a combo i think that's where we come up with the uh the, the veil the chain veil combo with the fairy uh decks have a modest budget that's the only thing that doesn't fit the category here because this is like a three thousand dollar deck but if you look at if you look at the <laughs> seven if you look at the seven refined down to just the best cards of their strategy i would argue no if you have like a hull breacher you want to have a wheel if you have like a nurse set you want to have a wheel uh yeah. perfect near perfect land bases i would say also no there's like cards like arcane sanctum multiple cheap wait, tutors wait, no, is like almost are. a perfect mana base he has all original duels in here arcane sanctum he, is good that's an esper but it, it enters tapped I feel like I feel like huh. it could have been it could there could be a little tweaks here. Multiple cheap tutors, absolutely not. I, I, don't I can't any. even find any. Uh, nope. Most decks are are generalists. Uh, most decks become less generalist as they foam uh, focus mostly on their primary strategy. I mean, this is pretty focused on planeswalkers, but I feel I would argue that it could be even more. Expect to least, least, see lots of powerful staples. Again, I don't see it here. Higher budget decks feel like common. That's a, I would agree that it's a higher budget deck. But like this, almost almost sentence by sentence, if you're following the criteria listed here for six, it is a six. The only thing that that I think uh, strays from that is the budget. But again, definition of budget is still also subjective. But like this is like literally a six. Like if I looked at the power level guide, I read every single sentence like I just did right now as a checklist, and then I looked at your at your list, I would say this is a six by the definition of this power level guide, like hundred percent. Like it's Here, not even it's not even unambiguous. With this, though, right? Like in terms of deck building, this is like, you know, an eight or nine out of ten, right? It's a really well put together deck. But you walk away with a six, and you feel bad. That's six out of ten. That's sixty percent. Why do that's you like, feel bad? I feel great. Like a D. I can play this. <laughs> what do you feel bad about it, though? That's that's just like trying the, to find a balanced table. Like I have it, a bunch of decks that are. But are the thing is, like lower. to to make your deck quote unquote better, right? Like for example, you say things like, if you play Hull Breacher, you need wheels, right? And then you're Yo. going to start stripping away kind of the core of this deck, which is an Esper Planeswalker deck, right? So. It's kind of like almost one of the best decks you could build given Crim's parameters. But I'm right? not. I'm not saying that it, it you have to. It has to be better. I'm saying that at its current power level, I think that it's a six. And there's nothing wrong with playing sixes. I feel like six that's, that's, is, that's a, is the a thing, table. though. It still feels bad that you have a six, Why? right? Even though there's like, if you called it anything else, if you called it a regular deck, you wouldn't feel bad, right? But because you're calling it a six out of ten, it feels bad. Is that is that a common perception though with the play group, or is that just I call it a six? Like, do you feel bad when I call it a six? No, I I feel I feel liberated. Uh, so oh, now yeah. when my uh, I'm like, hey, friends that I play with, I told you this wasn't that yeah, good. Like, like, <laughs> like, like remember the the point of this power level scale is to make sure that people's t uh, uh, decks are are relatively balanced with each other, and obviously there's going to be variation, and it's not going to be perfect, but like. This guide, I feel like pretty much nailed it. Like it gave you a very set checklist and I think it went there perfectly. So now now if I have a deck that I also graded against uh, this and it was also six, I would assume that if we played many games together, me and Krim with our two decks, uh, there would be a close level of power level. Now, obviously, my deck could counter his in terms of maybe I'm running just like a bunch, a billion, all my removal spells hit Planeswalkers or something. And all my board wipes hit Planeswalkers too. And I'm just like a burn deck or whatever like that. There's <laughs> more things there. But like in general, I think this is this is really good. <laughs> but, I don't know. Uh, but the other thing is it doesn't take into account fun. And like the whole thing about like... <sighs> 
<laughs> playing commander <laughs> and trying to balance power levels is sure. so everyone can have fun. I would imagine if I didn't know Krim and I went to a Magic Fest and I was like, hey, I got a six. My deck is a little better than an upgraded pre-con. And I'm going to like cast some creatures and try to do my thing. And Krim's like, oh, yeah, I'm a six, too. Like, look at the scale. And he's just like, wrath, 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 counterbalance. <laughs> like, I'm not going to come away from that experience having fun, even though we're both sixes, quote, unquote. Well, maybe maybe the power level guide is not the only criteria you should be using at games, but I think it's a very powerful one in terms of organization, organizing, organizing people. Wow, that took me a while. Organizing <laughs> people into general groups, right? Like if if we say like oh, all all the people who have uh, decks power level five to seven group up over here and then once you find that group it's now a smaller more manageable group you're like all right uh what do people want to not play against all right we don't want to we want to play the creatures and we want our stuff to like survive at least go on to onto the battlefield from the stack like if we cast it we want it to at least resolve and then you can remove it and then want to just like I want the game to end in a certain amount of time. And we're going to get to that a little bit further with the professor's video as we're going to be covering that further. But like, I feel like this is a powerful tool to at least get closer to balance, right? Like it doesn't, it won't, it won't cover fun. It won't cover strategies, but like I can pretty definitively say based on the scale that Crim's deck is like a six and that he probably should be paired up against other people who are between like five and seven. All right. All right. So next deck. Yes. Next deck. <laughs> we spent a long time talking about Esper yeah. Control. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Super let's friends. Go to, <laughs> let's Not go to. Control. Let's go to my Niv Mizzet deck as as a secondary. Uh, this is a personal deck list that I recently just threw in um, a mana drain in, and I felt really dirty about. No, uh, no but, Tomer, no. <laughs> but this is this is a, a deck that is I would say a little bit higher power. Um, it's a niv Perun deck, which I feel is a very powerful commander. Like as you, as everybody at the table has already experienced, um, he gets he gets to draw a lot of cards very easily. And uh, the deck is a spell slinger deck, so it's, it runs a bunch of cards that care about instants or sorceries. But it also has some very powerful combos. Uh, if you enchant niv Perun with either Curiosity, Aphidian Eye, or uh, Soul Bind him with Tandem Lookout. Uh, as soon as niv deals one damage to any player, you're going to draw a card, which will cause niv to deal one damage to any player. And then you draw a card, and it's a, basically an infinite damage loop a bunch of different ways, times that way. What would you think on power level scale? What, what would you say it was? Um, I would say it is like definitely, at the very least, a 7. I think it's a 7. I wow. would I would say that it's Probably between a five and a six. Ooh. Yeah, I think it's, I think a, it's a five strong and six because your mana base is budget, right? The like mana base is very rules budget. you out a seven immediately. You know, you don't have a perfect or nearly perfect land base. Mm -hmm. See, I was gonna say this is an eight, but that's because I feel this is the same power level as my super friends. <laughs> like I the mean, strategy is a lot stronger, right? But. <clears throat> And Are there's a very the powerful best cards, commander. Probably. Like, that's the other thing. Like, Niv is a busted commander, so you yeah. can play a lot of, like, bad cards. And if you have a Niv, who cares? Because they're all drawing an extra bad card, and that works out in the end. But I think the mana base for me would make me have a hard time putting it at seven. I think like you don't you don't have the tutors and you and don't six. have the mana crypts and mana vaults and things like that. So th th it should be at the same level as Crim's deck, roughly around. I mean, I have there, a couple right? tutors. I have Merchant Scroll, which I mean, it doesn't find the curiosity combo, but there's a second combo in the deck uh, that I neglected to say, which is the Isochron Scepter Dramatic Reversal combo. Where you basically cast dramatic reversal infinite times, make infinite mana, and that's infinite cast. So you win with uh, Niv Mizzet Perun or or Ral Storm Conduit. So you can find one of those pieces with Merchant Scroll, but you can also find it with uh, Muddle the Mixture, and I can also find Curiosity uh, by transmuting Dizzy Spell. So I can transmute uh, Muddle the Mixture for either pieces of the Isochron dramatic combo, or uh, transmute the uh dizzy spell to find curiosity but yeah it's limited it's, it is definitely limited in a uh, counter in uh tutoring aspects and there are a bunch of tap lands oh, i feel like this illuminates 
why I have such a hard time with the scale. Because when I look at this deck, I would be super scared to play against it. And if we were playing, you would probably be my initial pick for Arch Enemy at most tables, because I know how powerful Niv is. But then when I look at it and I see like Cold Steel Heart and Corrupted Graph Stone and <laughs> Swift Water Cliffs, I'm like, hey, how hey can I now. possibly rank this high, as highly as I want to based on this like criteria? Because it just doesn't meet the criteria of the higher rankings. Yeah, so this this sheds some some inconsistencies because this is the first time we've had like a big discrepancy. But would this, this deck, deck be so seven. powerful that you wouldn't want to play against it? I'd play against it. I'd just try to kill Tomer first, probably. <laughs> right. So, so in that sense, I mean, it's working, yeah. right? If if we rate the two decks like roughly the same and they play together, like close enough, right? <laughs> like whether we say it's a six or a seven or an eight, it's close enough that we would play together. So it's fine. Yeah. Right. Maybe I, I I think I think this would be a six if it, it was like ma a six, perhaps even well no I'd say it's a six if it didn't have Nimizid as commander and I feel the commander itself bumps it up to seven. That that that's my opinion on it. Um, but like maybe it is maybe it is just a six as well. Uh, yeah, but I I think I think it both could play with each other. Yeah, I I do think that both could have a good game with each other. I think uh, maybe. Maybe I maybe my deck has a little bit of a of, of an advantage because Nimbus is really good at pinging down uh, planeswalkers, um, but it really depends on the type of Esper Super Friends. Like if there were more targeted instant speed removal spells against Niv, then it would be a much harder time for me to do it. And uh, you know, there's a uh, Crim's deck has a lot of answers to creatures as well, so it'd be difficult for me to keep. Nimbus on on the battlefield, and both of us take a while to win the game because we don't have a lot of that, that many tutors. Um, yeah. Okay. So so, so yeah, like this wh whatever a... you would say your deck is, I would say mine is the same. Like well, like yeah. I would say we're about the same rank. Maybe maybe like the spells that we're playing and like Seth had mentioned earlier, the levels of fun <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> could be in question. But I would say that we are the same power level. <laughs> You're the yeah. same level of fun too. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I love this deck so I, much. <laughs> I think we are, like Tomer and I's deck are perfectly I... in the same pod. One second. Half the reason why is because, look at that, look at that. All right, if you're if you're just listening to Spotify, I highly recommend at least looking the article, because uh, yeah, uh, we have we have all this deck list. Does the deck box it's, it's, bring your ranking up uh, any <laughs> any amount of levels? Is that, Where is that in our criteria? This could be this could very be a nice deck box. Hashtag thumbnails. This is asterisk. If you have a matching deck box, increase power level by one. Yeah. All right. So so yeah. It's way better all, than all, mine. All, all our deck lists are going to be all our deck lists are going to be linked in the article and in the video section of YouTube. So if you're listening on Spotify, you can just check those out. We'll also have our power ranking scale there too. Uh, so we'll move on to Seth's deck. This is a Hans Eriksson deck. Tell us a little uh, bit about this. Uh, yeah, so. so so this is a Hans deck, and it's a Hans deck. It's trying to get Hans on the battlefield, hopefully with haste, put something big on top of the library with, like, Sylvan Tutor or Worldly Tutor or some other shenanigans like Cream of the Crop, and then hopefully put that big, like, Blight Steel or Crater Huff or World Spine Worm into play and one-shot someone, essentially, with a bunch of things to also protect Hans from the fighting when a creature comes into play. So me looking at this deck, I think... The one thing that keeps me from maybe putting it at a seven would be, I think the mana base has some tap lands and it's definitely not efficient. Doesn't have real dual lands, could be playing like more off color fetch lands. But otherwise, I mean, I think it has the cohesive plan. It's got the fast mana for the most part and it's got the cheap tutor. So I think somewhere between like six and seven is where I'd probably put it. You love MDFC so much. <laughs> there's like every like, MDFC in this deck. There's 29 lands in the <laughs> deck. Those I'm are like, tap Whoa, lands. There's something wrong. All <laughs> tap, tap lands. lands. <laughs> like this is good. <laughs> All my decks are like that. I'm a big believer in the MDFCs. <laughs> but you know the answer tap, right? There's a, this, there's a downside. <laughs> Well, I love them BFC them. Seth, but I don't love them as much as you I, uh, do. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anybody who loves them as much as you. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. So, I, I totally agree that there are some there are some uh, cards that I would consider uh, a little bit like like lowering the power level a little bit. Um, it has a definite strategy. Um, so, I think I think I, I would say it would be like at least a six. 
Uh, the, the spell choices, uh, I'm still following the, the checklist here. More focused, mixed levels of efficiency. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Uh, lands entering untapped are prioritized. I would disagree there. Uh, battle cruiser <laughs> decks are uncommon. Most decks contain at least one hard win con, usually a combo. I, I don't see any combos. Are there any combos in the deck, Seth? Probably oh. like uh, does like put blight steel on top of my deck and one shot you with Hans count as a combo. Like I think that's, yeah, that's most of your cards kind of finish the game pretty pretty efficiently. Yeah. Like if you put up a world spine worm and you're hitting somebody for 15 damage trample, uh, or even worse like a crater hoof or something like that. Like I think that's gonna kill people pretty fast. Like you yeah. have a lot of haymakers. So that that would be the um, combo, I guess, is tutor something to the top and then try to win with it. I think this would be like this would be like a, a high six. I think this would be a high six. It, it has some like faster starts, right? It has like Jeweled Lotus, Mana Vault, Soul Ring. It doesn't have Mana Crypt. Um, That's and, because of our banned list. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have a lot of untapped lands. Uh, it has cheap. It has some cheap tutors and like uh, top deck manipulation, especially um highly efficient ramp i think it has efficient ramp like you have a lot of two cmc ramp options you have some one cmc ramp options um yeah i i, I think i think this is a high six i see it as a like a definitely but once again like seth's deck here has a little it's a little bit more creature heavy but nonetheless i would say it's on the same power level as the decks that we have shown today so they're all about a high six what do you think, Richard? Wait, I, I think it's a six based on definition, but it's definitely not the same power level as both of your decks. What do you mean? No, there's creatures, like, <laughs> and, and, and like these creatures are like just by outside of, of him trying to play creatures and winning by like <laughs> combat. Like his strategy is worse than your decks, right? Is yeah, it uh, that much worse if he just puts up a Blightsteel Colossus and cheats into the play of Hans Ericsson and one shot somebody? I mean, that is the combo, but everything else he does is laughable compared to Niv Mizzet going off, right? I don't know. I I, I think like uh, putting putting down like a freaking what's it called Port Razor and just going like dun 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 in extra combat, extra combat, extra combat. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of a lot of nasty things that. Uh, this Hans that can actually pull off. I mean, it can, but would you sit down at a table and be like, Hans Ericsson, you got to kill him first, or like the Niv Mizzet player sitting there, <laughs> right? I would, I would still... Power I, level six, right? Yeah, I, I would still put... I still think Niv Mizzet is a seven, and I think yeah. this one's more of a high six. I think I would kill also the Niv Mizzet player more, more, uh, with more prejudice. But, but I still think like that's their commander, <laughs> though, right? Like that's just because yeah. the commander that there's is. something about inherent power in the command zone yeah. as well, right? Like a Hans Ericsson, like his his but, like, the rest of his deck could be really good, uh, but like his commander is not as strong as like a half combo piece sitting in the command zone, right? I think he's very scary. I don't know, like if if we played more games with Hans Ericsson. I think you'd be legit terrified as soon as he attacks, like every single time. Yeah, but he has to attack. He has to, okay, he has to attack, <laughs> but he has haste. He's in red. He'll be fine. Like, is it one of these, like, I was it, like, unfocused or something? All the way down, the deck is dependent on their commander being in play at all times to simply function. Like, that's one of the... <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd say that, because... But there is a bunch of ramps. So you just, I like, guess that's true. You do ramp into the bit. You can you just, cast just cast, cast it these cards. You just, yeah. yeah, you just cast them. Like, and it's not like any fun. of these creatures are bad on their own for the most part. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> like, it's, it's not like if you hard cast a Balefire Dragon, I'm like, ugh, Balefire Dragon. But I without be your commander, you're playing Battle play. Cruiser Magic, right? Like, that's the problem, right? True. Yeah. Yeah. He also Which has is... secondary ways of, like, it's not dependent on Hans. You can see Ilharg is another way to get stuff into play. Perforos is another play, a way to get into play. Uh, there's no sneak attack, but. Um, I mean, there's enough green creatures to attack. where, I don't know, like, oh, no, no, sneak attack doesn't care. I'm thinking Perforos, sorry. Yeah, Perforos. Like, it, aside from, like, the Lorgoyf, I'm like. <laughs> the Lorgoyf is the only there for flavor. flavor. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I respect that, but, like, there's the fast mana, there's a Dockside Extortionist. There's a jewel lotus. There's a mana vault. There's a soul ring. There's ways to give him haste, lightning grease, and hammer. Like it's very focused of a deck. There's alternate ways to get your creatures onto the battlefield, either by ramp or or by cheating them into play of perforos. I think this is like a high six, a high six, and definitely something that can play at the same table as the previous two. Okay, so we got the Hans. Finally, 
it's time for the birds. Richard, <laughs> tell us about this this bird tribal deck that you you brought to us at the table. All right, bird tribal. We're playing forty three creatures Jeez. of That's like worse than I thought. two of CFC birds. birds from Magic's history. Some of my favorite old birds. Okay, and. You have a lot of card draw with like things like Biden of Thassa and Distant Melody, and you're just gonna win with good old fashioned combat. Yes, right. It's like a twelve turn, you know, a twelve turn clock, uh, <laughs> twelve card combo where you assemble enough birds to beat people down. Okay, and the, the the most the closest thing to a combo that you can get to is like multiple birds Distant Melody or multiple birds Dovin's Veto. I mean Dovin's Grand Arbiter. Uh, and that's it. So you have a prismatic piper in your command zone, Richard. What are you doing? It's a bird. <laughs> I needed a white bird for my commander, right? There's a theme. Oh, man. <laughs> so, looking at the power scale, this has to be <laughs> a two like, or a three, right? This like, is like it can't I be think one. This is a four. I think this is like a four. Yeah, I would say this is a four. Uh. Oh man, like okay, so you have no tutoring capabilities. You have some powerful cards like Dowsing Dagger. It maybe this is a three even. There's <laughs> there are like things you can do that's really good. Like you play a bunch of low cost birds and then you put Biden of Thassa. But like there's so many there's so many situations where you just like draw your seven and you're like, oh, I have a bunch of Birds. one mana, one one flyers. That's exactly what the deck is trying to do. I, I, I won't lie to you. If I looked at this deck list, I would definitely say it's about a three because I would almost let you handpick your seven cards. Yeah, this, is, this is a three to me. I, uh, I decks think, have two, yeah. three basic strategies. I, I mean, it has four. one. I think so it's got to be a four because I think no, it has focus on birds. It has one basic strategy. The mana base is still ugly to look at, based yep. on real standards. Uh, may or may not have specific win cons in mind. Uh, doesn't really. It's kind of just like it's attacking and then the maybe fire. pumping the birds. Has some drawing, not really tutoring, but it's <laughs> mostly overcosted, low budget. I feel like it hits almost every mark of a four. You know what really hits me? The last yeah. sentence of two. Expect a glut of enter the battlefield tap lands and trap choices like Temple of the Falls God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh, we no. did a video on that. Temple of the Falls God. <laughs> kind of redeemed. Not really, though. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> Seth, you just you just sold me on it. Like, looking at the definition. Again, the definitions, I think, are really good. I, this is a solid three for me. And that's, uh, that's a bit generous, too. Like, it's not that... It's not that the... Uh, sorry, a solid four for me. It's not that, like, the cards are uh, drawing and tutoring is overcosted. Um, it's just that they're so... Few few of them that you kind of got to get like hope to find them and then snowball and hope they don't get removed why is there a the, coveted it's jewel? gotta be lower the gap is too small between like niv mizzet right <laughs> like how many decks can you fit between right like well like a four and a seven I don't think I don't think I don't think you would be comfortable bringing I this think deck it was a, at our a table. Six, Tomer. A six. I, you, I, uh, I literally bring these decks every week, Tomer. I know, <laughs> I know, I know, about? I know. Well, some some of us aren't like <laughs> godlike players, Richard. Yeah, right? Richard, some you beat us with the like, pre con. Yeah, Seth and I talking about. Yeah, like Seth and I had our decks. Like Seth had a Brago deck and I Richard, had my Animar deck and you beat, you beat us, us with a Kidkin, Kidkin, all right? You're a special case, all right? Not everybody is a Richard uh <laughs> piloting these decks. You know, like but, Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we, we we say three. I say three. You you guys say four. I say I, three. I, I say I could three. see I could see the argument for three too. But it's it's not laughably I, bad. But the board like, state, I think it's a lot better than a normal precon. But that's board what state is, right? matters is the name of the game. <laughs> that line right there in a three. Yeah. <laughs> is the I mean, reason. It, it resonates so well with this deck. Yeah. It has, like, no yeah. mana rocks, but that kind of yeah. makes sense if you're playing Fledgling off. What are you trying to so. ramp into? You're and playing yeah, two exactly. mana birds. It's <laughs> great if you just start with a Dowsing Dagger in hand, and it was, like, great when you hack actually had, like, a Biden Thassa. But what about the games where you don't find, like, those handful of cards? You have no way of tutoring them. None of your birds do anything. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're smack-talking this deck. We're smack-talking this deck. Me, but it did beat us. It did yes. beat all of us at, at Commander Clash. Which oh, is Krim the was it there. Thing. Yeah. I won with this deck. Yeah, he won with this deck. So, so context, folks, he actually beat us all with this deck. 
but like i think like first of all i think it is it has to do with pilot skill obviously like you had the you had to pilot it in a way where you weren't like overextended and you weren't like drawing too much attention to yourself and also i think i think consistency wise i don't think it's the most consistent deck like if we played multiple games i feel like there's gonna be a lot of games where you just don't find you know the the perfect top deck or whatever and and crush us it's, it's called mulliganing tomer sure, but, sure. What, so what do you think so you guys mentioned player Four. skill and that's something none of these things talk about well it's not a, it's, it's not as player it's not relevant ranking. it's not a player skill ranking it's a deck ranking but doesn't that affect the outcome of the play group definitely yeah definitely yeah, right? like, like, like if you have someone who's really good and then they come in with an eight deck like is they're just gonna steamroll the table it's right? more yeah it's it's going to be scarier than a person who like literally is new to magic and was just handed this deck list you know like two people piloting the exact same deck there's going to be a huge difference like i, I remember when we play cdh decks i remember like <laughs> we were just like it's a pile of we were playing like a pile of tutors i have no idea what to tutor for like i know i didn't build this deck i never played this deck before it's it tells it's very powerful i know like it could be very good it could be like a nine or a ten uh but i have no idea what, what's going on like they, they i vaguely understand the combo i'm gonna play it I'm going to play it as if it was like a five. I'd probably actually kill myself. I'd probably ad nauseum and murder myself. So it was, in that regard, it's like a two in my hands. But like the deck itself is powerful. <laughs> I love that yeah. episode because I remember like us reading our primers as we were going. <laughs> like, hold, hold on one second. What does it say here? And the first I time think... we did CDH playing <clears throat> other people's decks, uh, Richard p- picked Rurik Thar. No tutoring, no, no, nothing fancy there, and he just destroyed all of us. He just one v three the rest of the table and killed us because we had no idea what to do. Wasn't it the same <laughs> time when we a second time around when we did CDH when he just goblined us immediately. He's goblined us, and he knows also, he knows he knows the lines. We don't know the lines. We yeah, wouldn't be able to do that. I also think it goes the other way too because Richard plays a lot of decks that probably rank lower than the rest of ours on the scale. But because Richard's really good at playing Commander, uh, he wins a lot with them. So I feel like even if Birds is like a three or a four, when Richard's playing it, it's probably like on it's par with all of our decks. Yeah, it's probably a six. And it like keeps up with the rest of the table because of Richard's skill yeah. playing Commander. You're allowed to bring a worse deck. Yeah. Theoretically, right? Like as long as you know that you're bringing a knife to a gunfight. Right, you just don't want to be surprised. But if you know what's going on, you're yeah. allowed to bring a worse deck. And to so, me, it's more enjoyable to play bad cards than to play good cards and to win. <laughs> right? Like I think that goes for a lot of us. Right? We just yeah. play Grixis piles because why not? Right? Or we just draw excuse cards. Excuse me. <laughs> why not? Right? So, yeah. Richard, if if you're gonna try to get a even match at a command fest. Do you think it would be correct for you to say this is a six because you're playing it, even though by the definition it's a four? But like, if everyone else was playing fours, you're probably gonna crush them because well, you're I, I would feel really bad playing this deck at a table of new players and precons. So I would not match myself against other threes, right? But wouldn't you feel bad if you were playing a new against new players and you were running the same precon as them and then just schooling them with it? At like it doesn't really matter what I deck guess, you just don't maybe. want to be playing as new players, right? I guess I guess yeah. in that sense it's actually it's, if I was going to school someone, I'd school them with like you know bad birds, right? So <laughs> maybe you're right. I don't know. <laughs> then they can't even use the excuse while well, oh he was playing a high powered deck. It's like he I mean it just goes birds. down to how you play. Like if I play against new players, I'm not going to take like the most aggressive lines and and try to win, right? I'm not going to like yeah. tutor for my game ending one sided board wipe and like destroy them all. I would just do random stuff and like try to have fun right so i guess it matters how you play the game as well uh when you sit down right if you know everyone's new you know yeah you can take back three turns it's fine (laughs) right (laughs) you know if you're playing down at cdh like you tapped wrong too bad sorry (laughs) right Mm -hmm. so yeah i guess it depends on the context of the game too right yeah okay so we went over everybody's sample deck lists with this right. power ranking scale has people's opinions changed on this power ranking scale now uh that we've uh, used it i think i think it's even worse now because everyone thinks their deck's an eight no matter how bad it Wait, might no, be we, we just all came to like our decks are sixes except mine which <laughs> I is think close that's fair but i think I, we, we all started off overrating our decks 
Like, uh, based I on what our that, consensus yeah. was, everyone yeah. was right. like, oh, I'm an eight. And then we talk about it and we're like, eh, actually, maybe it's a six. Or I was like, oh, mine's probably a seven. And we're like, eh, probably it's a six. So I don't know. I guess it shows part of the challenge when you go to sit down at a, I mean, maybe you just discount everyone's grades by like two because you assume their ego or whatever is like <laughs> bumping it up a little bit, the ego tax. <laughs> it's, could it's, it also, sorry, it's funny because like normally people, this is the, I would feel like the first time in a group where we overrate our decks <laughs> right <laughs> like because normally i remember at gp vegas someone's like oh i have a silvala deck it's about a six and it's like it, it won on like turn two or something like that yeah so i don't uh, know no, normally that's the general situation like that's the situation <laughs> because you don't want to overrate your deck and end up in a pod of cedh players so you like yeah. lowball it so you play with like you know, reasonable decks, Birds. but then it turns out your deck is actually good. Birds. It could also be like, like, uh, like a nagging thought of like, I, I don't want to lose. I want to have a higher chance of winning. So you, you, you look for the bird deck table. that way. Yeah. <laughs> like, hope you get paired. I'd be the terrified of losing. So my eight that, is more. I think of a that's five. also very true because we play so much magic, right? If we lose, we're like, whatever, sleeve up next game. You know, next week, next hour, next minute. If you are a casual player and let's say you go to Magic Fest and Magic Fest comes around once a year and it's the only time of year you can play EDH, right? It's important for you to have uh, good games and very important for you to match up with the, you know, similar players, right? But you'll also want your deck to like do its thing and maybe even win, right? This could lead mm -hmm. you to altering the power level of your deck, right? Maybe you lowball it to make sure you play against bird decks so that the game does go to turn eight so you can actually like play your three card combo right like maybe that is a thing right I, I don't i don't know right or maybe you worked really hard on this deck and you think you know it's an eight out of ten because you put so much effort into it right uh so there's like a different there are different factors that come into play that we don't understand because we play magic too much but you know yeah once a we year grand prix like... players right like they, they have a different mindset right yeah, our sample size is so high. Like we play so much magic that we it, you can't you can't go in playing this much magic wanting to win every single game, right? Yeah. Because then you will just you will hate the game after like week 4 of play like 10 plus games every single week, right? Like you're going to be losing so much. You have yeah. to get you have to get accepted to the, the fact that and that's not the case for a lot of people where where you're just playing commander maybe maybe once a month and you get two games in you want to make sure like richard said those games are going to be good i'm going to have fun and part of that fun criteria for me is me pulling off cool things and slash winning the game usually that that's what pulling off means i i kind of feel like going through this experience with our decks does show how this would work i think for a play group that's playing together all the time but then i'm not sure like it's necessary for a play group because if you have a play group and you're playing every week or every month, you probably have other ways of like socially keeping people's decks in lines or your friends. And you'd be like, Hey, don't play that. Cause you know, I'm not going to invite you next time. We won't be friends anymore or whatever. Crim. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but we even have house bands. We all spoke like as a post mortem and we're like, these are the cards that we don't enjoy playing in our environment. And we house banned them because of that reason. There was also some cards that we just house banned for the sake of, because we're, we run Commander Clash, we want to make stuff a good viewing experience as well. Um, so we, we ran some cards, like we banned some stuff that we were running too much. We want some variety because we think that's going to be better for the viewer experience. Or we want less variance, you know, like, so we have a bunch of things, but like that, like never, we never talk about like, oh, my deck is a power level six for next week so everybody sh shoot for a six we've played so much that we just know we just know yeah. what, what's acceptable and what's not and when we overshoot it we usually understand that pretty quickly usually in the yeah. usually when we debrief like we do talk about games uh decks in the game and after the game we'll be like ah this this deck was too powerful this time and we'll, we'll know not to do it uh next time you know i think Sometimes we've been we really good about that like that like I, our our play group is very good at matching each other's power level like I think the only time we haven't was the one time where Seth made a bunch of ice treasures and then and then like and then passed hey, the turn. Hey, hey now, Savella's <laughs> still sweet. I got I got I got I got angry emails about Svella, By the way, there's a lot of Svella Spella stands 
that are very upset that I smack talked uh, <laughs> so I, I, I apologize. In it's advance. okay. My inboxes are o- my inboxes are open to all the so yeah. Bella. But, but <laughs> yeah, imagine we we're strangers and we we're gonna play these four decks at a grand prix. We sit down, we get an eight and eight, a six and a. What did Richard initially say? Two or something? Like you had a pretty low score <laughs> initially. Right? I think two or three, but and I think we, we ended around, up at three or four. Hmm. And then we sat around for a half hour and like went over the criteria and batched it out. And we eventually determined, eh, we're all like pretty close. We could play these decks against each other and it would probably be a fine match. But does anyone want to do that at a magic fest? Do you wanna do you wanna take a half hour hmm. of like reading line by line through the list and like debating if this is a six point five or a seven or three or four like like, do you actually want to do that or do you just want to play magic that that's also true it's i I think all of us said we're like an eight or whatever initially like but we didn't read the we didn't read this power ranking guy we we we, like once we actually went through the power ranking guy then it was very easy like there was no major ambiguity there but like i just said mine's like a seven uh, without even looking at the criteria. And then when we looked at the criteria, it was like, wait a minute, it is a six. But, like, the commander is really scary. Uh, so maybe that maybe that increases a little bit more. Maybe it's a high seven. You're a high six, you know, like that. Um, so, like, we had self-assessments. We had our own idea of what a, a scale is, but it was based on our own perception of what a, a scale is, not actually using this scale. And when we used it, it was a lot easier to, to figure out. But, like, like you said, like, Sitting down and, and and doing all that for just one game of magic with some randos, is that is that uh, is that something practical? Is that something a lot of people are willing to do? Spend half an hour or whatever to like if, everybody use the same power ranking guide, look at the checklist, figure it out, uh, and agreeing you, on the same checklist too. If you pulled the checklist so out of your practice. backpack at a magic fest. I would probably <laughs> not want to play. Deck like, all right, guys, I got, I got the list. Gather uh, around. <laughs> Hang on. Wait, yeah. no. Wait, that mana base, that's the tap land. So at, at Magic Fest. Well, is that that's a dual one land? mark against it. Uh, <laughs> the most common way, the most common thing people say, right, is not actually power levels in my experience, but it's also maybe because they know us, but they usually come up and say they're commander and if they're running infinites or not. Like apparently infinites is a very important thing, right? It, it just tells you whether they're comboing off or not. Mm-hmm. And usually that and your strategy, like I'm playing stacks. You guys want to play against stacks or I'm playing, you know, a really sweet bird deck, right? Like you immediately kind of know the power level. Like it doesn't matter how tuned that bird deck is. Like, you kind of know what the power level is. And given the commander, you also know what the scary commanders are, right? right? And you know, if they're running like, yeah, I'm running... You know, I'm running two card combos. I'm running, um, you know, Helm of Hosts uh, Bandit <laughs> combo, or I'm running Thassa's Oracle combo. And I think, like, those answers only take, like, you know, 20 seconds, but that gives you a fairly good idea of the deck uh, according to your ideas, right? Like, you can interpret how good that is based on your scale, and you can power match uh, that deck, right? And a lot of people had multiple decks, right? If you're like, oh, that's probably too strong. They're like, oh, look, I have this pre-con here, or I have this other deck here. I have skeletons or whatever, right? Like, they have multiple decks uh, to to try to power match levels with. So I think that's how it actually works in practice. Because like Krim said, he comes back and he's like, yeah, I played a game of sevens, and we got, like, turn two destroyed, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, yeah. everyone's seven, like, means nothing, right? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And like it's never it's always never going to be perfect, right? Like, right. Like like I said before, like some some decks run hot, some don't. So even if even if like ideally it's perfect based on your your agreed upon criteria, it won't ever pan out that way. Or sometimes people just get it wrong, you know? Like, oh, I didn't play this deck for a while. I guess it it pops off a lot faster than I thought. Oh, like you know, this fast mana was just ran really well for me, and I didn't expect it to be. Like that just happens. And yeah, I think like, I think the problem with like all these grading scales is like, yeah, uh, the amount of time you need to spend to make sure it works well and uh, who you're doing it for. Like if you're playing with your play group, you don't really need this. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you play with them very often and like everybody's already meshing well, then you don't need this. 
Um, and if you're in a random uh, pickup game at like an event or whatever like that, then this might take too long. Like you just you only have time for like an hour and a half worth of magic, and you don't want to spend an extra half hour of that uh, debating on the specifics of the power level. I think Seth already kind of echoed it, right? Like I don't think most yeah. people want to sit down for thirty minutes <laughs> and discuss the interest intricacies of their deck before playing yeah. a game okay right? so because we'll, where this matters most is when you're trying to play like one game and it has to be good if you yeah. can play like eight games it doesn't matter right but if you can play one game you can't spend 30 minutes of it discussing deck details right all right so that is the power ranking scale or at least one example of it one that i think is actually a good example of it but like if you if you have even better scales you know or more popular ones that we neglected uh, you can leave us a comment as well, and we'll check those out. Uh, but there is some alternatives to the power ranking scale. Like we already discussed, uh, if you just you know talk with your player or uh, with your play group, if you have a if you have a if you have a, like a regular play group, uh, you don't need to scale at all because you just play with each other, and you will kind of suss out how your decks compare to others over the course of many many d different games. However, uh, for people who are also trying to use a power ranking system to make sure that strangers together can meet up and play at a balanced play group, uh, there was one notable alternative that recently came up uh, that the professor over at Tolarian Community College recently posted, and it was like a, a big video, uh, where, he, where he made the argument of actually uh, removing this power level, this concept of power levels um, in Commander, uh, either remove it entirely or like kind of use it like as sparingly as possible and replace it with another system to figure out balance at the table. And his criticisms uh, against power levels is, is kind of like what Seth said uh, initially, at least, uh, the subjective and arbitrary. Um, and people always have different assessments, which I think is definitely true uh, with all of us, as you can see uh, when we were doing our own assessments of our own decks. We all we all came up with an initial number that was very different than what we ended up with. Um, and he discussed four different alternatives, three of them being pre-game uh, pre-game things you should be doing. And then one thing, uh, one thing that you want to be doing after the game so the first three things before you even before you even start the game of magic uh the pre-game thing instead of doing a power level discussion uh number one uh you ask the table how long do we have to play or how long do you want to play uh the example being grindy games or stacks games go very long and fast combo decks or like group slug decks like uh uh, Mogus got a slaughter, for example, uh, end up making the game go really fast. So if you have like a burn deck at the table, then the game will go faster. And maybe you don't want to have a, a fast game. You want to have a, a slow game and then grindy games, stacks games go longer. So figure out in general, how much time, how much time do you want to spend on this activity? Number two, are we playing to win or are we playing to socialize, uh, being social or competitive? And Prof made a really good point where most salt comes from subverted expectations where you're sitting down and you think you're, you're going to have this casual game of magic where the primary focus is actually just to chat and have like a long game of dirtling uh, in, in the background. Uh, whereas, you know, some people might be playing competitively and their, their main focus at the table is to play to win. So subverting expectations is the cause of salt, which I think was really smart. Um, and then the third thing you want to ask uh, at the table before you bust out the, the decks is what you don't like playing against. What are you not in the mood for? And his example in the video was like, let's say you've just played a bunch of games against like control decks, blue control decks that just counted everything, removed all your permanents, and you just were just allowed to just sit at the table not doing anything for a long, long time. Maybe after doing that two or three times, you're like, you know what? I don't want to play against like a hard control deck. I want, maybe maybe we can mix it up and we focus on more like aggressive creature-based strategies instead. Um, and he said like, fun is not a zero sum, sum game. Uh, don't use it as an excuse to disallow certain deck strategies from being played. Number four is you pick a deck for the table, not the game. Um, and you want to choose a commander that is the right tier, not power level, tier, 
Um, and he only gave three options. Basically, classic tier, which are like cool but low impact commanders. He said Yor uh, Yeva, Korlash, Lyra, Dawnbreaker. Uh, strat uh, the second tier is strategy payoff enabler, like mid tier, uh, which would be like Feather, Alila, and Marin. And then finally, top tier is like Golos, Kenrith, Korval, these high impact commanders. And then after you play that game, you should have a post-game debrief, number five. Uh, you find out how everybody felt about the, how the game went, if everybody was happy with the experience, and then how to adjust for the next game uh, now that you have that, that knowledge. So five things to do uh, when you're matching up instead of a power ranking system. So that was a spiel. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> I think that talking more is good. Uh, I think that, that that makes sense to me, talking with the, your playgroup or who you're playing with. I like some of uh, some of the ideas. I'm not sure about the tier list of commanders. I think just based on my own experience, like one thing that I remember recently is playing a game with, uh, with Vince, and I think you were there, Tomer. Were you there when I played the Big Lebowski deck? Yes. Eh, okay, yeah. But I had Golos. And he was like Reaper King? I, I had Golos as my commander. Oh, yeah, and Golos yeah. is like top tier, one of the legitimate best commanders you can play. But my deck was a one. It was a literal one. It was Squires and just a pile. all Big Lebowski. It was the literal pile. So I feel like if you focus too heavily on just like commander tier lists, I don't know. I don't think that works any better than this ranking scale, honestly, because your commander doesn't necessarily describe the power of your deck because you can build really bad decks with a good commander or really good decks with a bad commander. Okay. Richard, any thoughts on these? I, I would points? say the, the only relevant one was for the tier of commander. So like how long do we want to play? I think is kind of irrelevant because you can't control it, right? There's some notion that CEDH goes fast, but it doesn't, right? It only goes fast when there's a lopsided victory, right? It's just you're doing more interaction on the early turns. But, you know, unless you're all like Armageddoning each other or whatever, like games are always commander. Like there's enough variance that it doesn't matter. You're going to sit down for like two, three hours and try to play a game. So I don't think that's relevant. Number two, no one's trying to win, I don't think, right? Like, you know, you just rule out the CEDH players. Well, they're CEDH players, right? Everyone else is trying to socialize or they're at least pretending to socialize while trying to win, but like they're going to fall under the socialized group, right? So that I think is also irrelevant, right? Like no CEDH player is really going to sit down with someone playing pre-cons and like roll them and be happy with it. So that is irrelevant. Three, what don't you like playing against? I also think is irrelevant, like... You can request someone play a different deck, but usually what that means is you play a different deck, right? Like if Krim wants to play control and I'm playing like some tribal deck, I'm like, maybe this is not the week to play tribal decks because I don't want to get, you know, wiped every turn. I'll just play this other deck. So usually that's within your control by playing multiple decks because you can control bringing two decks. You can't control Krim having two decks, right? Like maybe his other deck is... Grixis versus Esper control. You're out of luck. He's playing control, right? So you control that by bringing different that decks. Is, that is a real. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is literally so what I happens. think number four is true. I think number four is if someone's playing goals, you should be afraid of them. But if they say, hey, I'm playing Big Lebowski theme deck, you're like, okay, I'm not afraid, right? If, there's, if they say, hey, I'm playing, you know, an optimized Golos deck, you should be very afraid. Or if they say, I'm playing Golos, but I'm just playing like a budget version, you should be mildly afraid. But I do I also, think the commander matters, right? Yeah. Along I also found archetype. it a little bit weird because, like, I know I've seen, like, Larry Dawnbringer. They put it at the classic tier, the lowest the lowest rung. But, like, classic. there's a big difference between, like, a Larry Dawnbringer. Hey, I just had a bunch of, like, random. Uh, I collect I collect angel cards and I just put a bunch of angels in the deck. And it, it won't even cast a spell until turn five. Versus, like, I'm a Lyra Dawnbringer deck. My deck is $5,000. I go, I run every single zero CMC mana rock. And every single, I eke every single little advantage I can get in mono white. It's actually an equipment deck. I run the entire sword cycle. And I also have a bunch of combos. Yes, combos in mono white. Like, okay, but yeah, that's stronger than the Golos Big Lebowski deck. Like, man. Yeah. Number That's four, I, like you got, you got to ask them what their deck is, right? Like, yeah. I am playing a really good Lyra deck, right? I have all the white staples. Versus, I took every five CMC angel from my binder and put it in this deck because I love angels, right? <laughs> that tells you immediately what the deck power level is, right? That's all you need to know, right? You just need but, to know, I guess, their then, intent in deck building. Did you put all the cutthroat cards in, like? 
if you're playing mono red, are you playing the two card combos, right? Are you playing cards like Insurrection, right? Or are you playing like Stone Rain for the lulls? I don't know, right? So I think Did Commander we... plus Intent is good enough to for you to make up your own power scale, right? You can be, yeah, that's a six in my mind or that's eight, whatever. It doesn't matter because it's consistent in your brain, right? It kind of seems like we wrap back around to the the power level scale, though, because if you're going to be like, oh, I have like a nine Lyra compared to a two Lyra, like, yeah. then aren't we kind of like somewhat wrapping back around to the same thing that we started with a, a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe I think the scale is good. I just think there should and be three tiers. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I like, see this. this is, it, right? I think this would like eliminate but. a lot of that, right? If we just cut out like a ton of tiers, just like jank. I'm playing an angel deck, you know, like or or something like that, or I'm playing a bird deck. So I I really like Richard's idea of just lobbing off a ton of this. Sure, I think that's what I would prefer too. Like cut off CDH, cut out the random pile of cards, and focus on the like three to eight range, and have that be kind of. Uh, you know two or three levels in there or whatever you need to do and maybe that would be a little bit more comprehensible and a little faster because then maybe we're not debating each line of this power scale like oh is it like a focus plan or a specific plan and trying to debate like the merits of those words and whatnot hey you're more main... focused than i thought you were hold on <laughs> I think the main thing with ha- including like cdh is like being inclusive like not trying to like swat off cdh at the rest of the table but i am not part of the cdh community so i'd love to hear from cdh players if they want their decks to be even on the scale or you just want it on a, on a separate scale Wait, in general. i don't i don't think cdh they're should playing a different be... game right i'm mean, not, not like there's so. anything wrong with cdh what it is is that like there's no reason to have them on the scale because the point of cdh is to build the most optimal version of whatever deck right and like the yeah. best deck and find the best way to win the game so if you're if you're it's not like i'm going to show up with my at the cdh pod and be like hold on but the game plan is to competitively beat you with Shadow Mage Infiltrator. <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? I don't, like, I don't it's know. inherent I think, I think in it's the game, right? Yeah. I don't think CDH is its own thing. It's just a spectrum. It's just like something has to be a 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 on the power level. And that's what we call CDH. Like, but, that's just. But you where never play with non CDH. Though. The philosophy is different. That's the, for me, yeah. that's the, the, the difference. Yeah. And that's why I think of CDH as its own thing is like. Everything from one to eight is playing social games, like primarily. And then if you're playing nine or ten, you're playing legacy multiplayer, vintage multiplayer, with your goal being to win. So that's for me, that's what the cutoff is. I feel like the very ethos of the formats are are what separates it. It's different because one, you're trying to win; one, you're trying to like have fun and socialize. Uh, I mean, I'm not part of CDH, so like, I'm not. I'm not going to to debate the merits on CDH here because I I think they're I think it's fine I think they're tr- trying to have fun as well and I I like having them on the scale but like I, I mean, don't even know maybe fun. CDH don't don't want them yes yeah, I mean, they should be their own fun. tier it's yeah they should have fun. their own tier like, yeah. but when you're trying to sit down and determine power levels like they, you don't need to you know if you're CDH fine right but like you don't need to be there but you don't yeah, want to sit down I guess and it's CDH kind of and roll some precons right like. <laughs> I guess in a way it is irrelevant when like CDH like the difference between like an eight and a nine on this tier list might be a little bit bigger than, than an eight and a seven, for example. It could just be like two different two different like planes here. Um it, and it, if that is true, then I think that makes sense to uh to lop them off and it's and just like to... the pile of cards can be lopped off. Doesn't mean you can't yeah. play, right? Like if you're no. a like a, a beginner or you just like put together a deck, you can still play with the group. Yeah. But, like, there's no point in trying to assert your power level when you're just a beginner, right? Like, you don't know what's yeah. going on or you haven't built a real deck. You just put some cards together. Like, there's no point in trying to fine-grain that and, like, convolute, uh, you know, what you're trying to determine, right? Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, I also... The, the, the reason why we, we brought up the whole power level thing it was mostly spurred by... Uh, the professor's video like that that seemed like a good talking point like what we trying to analyze the power level scale now that you know we had a chance to sit down and 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 think about it um i i i love the professor's ideas on it but like i don't think i i personally much prefer like having a universally accepted power level guide and and using that as a shorthand and then discussing together if you have extra time but like prof prof suggestions i think 
runs the exact same problems as the power level system where like if you have these five talking points or whatever uh it's, it's very time consuming and if you have that much time then i think you, you i think you'd be better off just using a power level checklist that has everybody agreed upon and go through it together like we just did um and also i feel like he kind of painted himself into a corner when he talked about tier lists because like his entire thing was removing power ranking scales and then he literally adds a power ranking scale into it. And that one is worse because like we, we just simplified. talked about like a bad, <laughs> badly made Golos that is a pile of cards is going to be worse than like a top made optimized Lyra deck. So like I feel like I feel like I was like nodding my head to him with like uh number one to three and then number four, I'm like, whoa, prof, what what happened here? What's going on? <laughs> I, I think I the overall message is correct, though, in that it's, you don't yeah. just like throw a number out there and call it a day, that there needs to be a little discussion. And you're trying to achieve the same goal, which is to socialize and have fun. And that we do need a bit of discussion. Now, we don't agree on the particular questions being asked or how long and things like that. But, you know, it's, it's a discussion and a number doesn't encapsulate the discussion, right? So there, there should be like a little discussion. But usually when we play, the discussion is like, one minute right like for yeah. everyone right it's not like this in-depth breakdown yeah. right it's Are just killing quick enough yes yeah yeah we always feel like oh, we, we discuss kill that? <laughs> we really never discuss kill that. that that's because you're always like five minutes late walking thor we do we, we, <laughs> yeah, we talk about get there. Not in, in the chat yet. <laughs> so one last question for you guys do you think the rules committee should do something about this since they are the governing body of EDH, should they set forth a standard or a guideline or say, you know, officially, this is the power level rating we use for all EDH events such that, you know, Channel Fireball doesn't have their own thing for Magic Fest and then uh, Command Fest or whatever. And then the next online tournament you use does like the profs method. And it's just like this hodgepodge of ideas. Should they actually step in and do something about this? Hmm. I would say not them in particular. <laughs> I want them to do as little as possible. I, this, so is, this is a topic either. for another time. But my my uh, <laughs> I like the RC as long as they do their their number one job for me is to be stability. Right? Don't do anything, but just be there. Be really good at not doing anything. I really <laughs> like I really like that role that they have. Um, so if a lot of people say use this power ranking scale and it became just universally accepted in the community that this is what the majority of people like and use when they're doing like webcam EDH or doing organizational events and channel fireballs using it and like the discord servers where you can find EDH games are using it too. Then it would be cool for the RC to adopt it and be like, we prom we promote this specific kind. I do not want the, the rules committee to make their own, though, because I feel like that would be a disaster. <laughs> I, uh, I think that having one list that everyone agreed upon would be valuable. Whether or not the RC has to do it, that is another question that... I kind of lean with Tomer. Like, I don't know if it needs to be their rule to do it or to uh, support one that comes out of the community. But I still don't like having 10 different items in the 1 to 10 scale. So I hope if we do unite around one of these lists that it's simplified and has less numbers on it and then hopefully is a little more meaningful. What do you think, Bram? I mean, for me, I, I, I don't know. That's a tough question because, like, I don't... Yeah, like, I, I don't think that this is necessarily something that the RC needs to do. I, I, it's just kind of simple as that. I just, I, I feel like this isn't exactly their their th issue, right? Because, I mean, how do you govern a whole group of people or help them out when it's, like, a lot of subjective stuff? I feel like it's more like a signal boost. Like, I don't want them to do it. I literally yeah. just want them to signal boost whatever the community settles upon, but the if community... they ever do settle upon. Exactly. That's the thing. You're also like, well, hold on. <laughs> the community yeah, it... ha can't, like, hasn't settled on so like anything, really, right? Like, I mean, we bounce around between tons of stuff, like, all the time. Like, should multicolored spells, be, like, you know what I mean? Like, um, whatever hybrid mana spells be in Commander decks, you know? Or, or, or yeah. just, you know, like, so I... It's just hard because th that's the weird thing about commanders. There's so many subjective things uh, added into it. Yeah, 
there's too many variables. That's the inherent nature of the format. It's like it's hard to pinpoint and say objectively this is this is what what the deck is. This is what the play group is. Blah 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 blah. Because like it's a hundred card format with a, a deck that's inherently very high variance, and there's four of us, and it's also a social game. How do you objectify social games? I don't know. There's a there's a lot of variables here, but yeah, okay. So maybe maybe don't have the RC uh, involved in it, and maybe maybe do. I don't know. Let us know in the comments section below if you're not listening on Spotify. If you're listening on Spotify, thank you very much. Um, but okay, so that's basically it, everyone. I think we covered everything. Uh, are we gonna do fish mail today? <laughs> you mean clash mail, Probably which we haven't episode. done. Clash three mail. episodes because we keep going over. <laughs> we go <live> so over. <laughs> All right, maybe we just make maybe we just make a little. Why don't we do outro. two? Just like pick two, right? Like like. All right. We just don't go over like like two. Uh, we're already an uh, hour and thirty eight minutes. Just yeah, like, one lucky winner. One yeah. lucky winner. Tony. All right. All right. So <laughs> we're going to finish it with one singular clash mail uh, question <laughs> because we're way over. Um, Alexander Miller. This is a question that actually I get emailed a lot. So let's just go for it. What are some things you wish people would include more in viewer submitted decks? Ramp removal, etc. Is there a recipe for a top tier viewer submitted deck? Thank you for the question, Alexander Miller. What what are what do you guys look for in a viewer submitted deck? Oh, for a viewer submitted deck, I look for interaction. Uh, like legitimately it has to have interaction and I don't know the more ways that you can kind of like troll people is like probably like funnier and like whatever just seems like a like if it's got a funny like idea or theme behind it like like Richard's the deck when Richard would pick to skip your own turn that's a funny idea that's a trolly kind of idea and it's it it's something that I can get down with so I would pick something like that just seems funny to me if it makes me chuckle or like somebody sent me literally an all bolus theme thing where it had everything bolus, everything. And the only reason why I didn't pick it was because Moto didn't have the cards. Fair enough. I think for me it's kind of there's no way to guarantee that I'll select your list. Although I do tend to look for like janky, fun, different themes that I haven't played before. But if your deck list doesn't have the basics, like some ramp, some card draw spells, hopefully like a little bit of interaction. If it's missing that, even if I really like the theme, I feel like I can't pick it because I know I'm not going to have fun once I just like run out of cards and don't do everything. So it's more like you got to get to this minimum standard of like playability. And then I'm looking for like the janky fun themes or something unique that I've uh, never done before. Once you hit that like baseline of like, okay, the deck's functional. Now show me something sweet on top of that functionality. I'm actually opposite from you guys. (laughs) I like to pick decks that don't look like decks I've built. Uh, so it may be lacking a lot of ramp and card draw, and I'll play it just to see if it works, right? Because if it follows, like if, if all the decks I choose had dousing, like I know how that card works, right? But sometimes people play some weird janky stuff. I'll be like, huh, does that actually work? I play it. Maybe it doesn't work and it's horrendous, but at least, you know, I, I learned something, which is why I like when viewers submitted decks. So if you have a strange theme, And it also is not the style of deck I would play, right? Like, uh, I really like that just to experience, because that's the one time I get to experience a deck I don't build, right? To see maybe there's another strategy that works really well, or there's a combo that I never saw or thought of. And so I like exploring those parts. Yeah, and I'm pretty much the same. Like, I love gimmick decks. I love decks that I personally would not, like, play multiple times, but it has a really cool gimmick, a cool theme that's like like a one line sentence that is like you know silly like maybe it's like it's a cowboy bebop deck and i love cowboy bebop and i don't really care about the cards themselves but as Seth said like if if it has the fundamentals too like if you just give me like a deck concept and it's clearly like you just put in like a bunch of concept cards and you cut it down to 100 cards and there's like 20 lands and no ramp and no card draw and like it just it it literally just copy pasted a bunch of cards you thought were cool and threw them together. And then I'll probably notice and I won't click it. Um, but yeah, I just like gimmick stuff. I like stuff that I haven't played before. Uh, be it a combo that's really silly and janky, uh, or a concept or a commander that I haven't played. Uh, generally speaking, though, if you like give me like Golos or Korvold or something like that, I won't click it. 
And also, I refuse to take anything that has Cauldra in it or Moonfolk in it. Because I feel like both of those things are like kind of very, kind of personal for me, you know? Like, they're personal projects, and I don't want to play somebody else's deck. I feel like part of building the deck is part of my enjoyment of it. So I'm never going to... I'm never going to pick somebody's college deck, and I got a lot of those submissions, for example. Um, yeah. So that's it. All right, friends. We went over this uh, quite long podcast. Hopefully, uh, not all of these will be quite as long. We're shooting for an hour, folks. We're shooting for an hour. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you want to get your questions answered on a future podcast, send us a tweet at hashtag clashmail. And we will select from uh, those uh, search results over there. You can also like email us or whatever. But ClashMail is the easiest way because we just type it and it's super easy to, to pick it up. So use hashtag ClashMail. Tweet it out on the Twitter. And uh, we, will, we, might, we might choose it for a future podcast. And that's it, everybody. Hope you enjoyed our discussion on power ranking systems. And we'll be back uh, bi-weekly. That's the plan. Actually, we're going to be showing up with a special podcast next week, I think. Very special, very unique, huzzah, I think. Maybe, Richard, yes? Yes, perfect, <laughs> nailed it. Don't need to edit this part out. Uh, so we're going to be back next week for a special podcast. And uh, from then on, we're going to go bi-weekly. I think that's the plan. So until next time, friends, see ya.